All right, Psalm 84 uh, this evening. We'll wrap up our study through this psalm tonight with the last two verses, Psalm 84 and verses 11 and 12. If you recall uh, last week, we looked at uh, verses 8 through 10, and in that, uh, in those three verses, the psalmist uh, begins to petition, uh, to petition God. Um, he begins to ask God for, uh, for what he needs. He says in verse 8, hear my prayer. And then he says, give ear. And then in verse 9, he asks God um, to look upon the face of his anointed. And then he, in verse 10, um, reflects on, or uh, I guess you could say reiterates, uh, what he had um, shared from his heart in verses 1 through 3 there, or verses 1 through 4, um, the blessedness of the uh, God or, or dwelling in God's presence. And now in um, verse 11, why don't we... Um, why don't we just read nine through eleven or nine through twelve here, just to kind of get um, some of the context? Behold, O God, our shield, and look upon the face of Thy anointed. For a day in Thy courts is better than a thousand. I had rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is a man that trusteth in thee. And so he, as we saw in verse 10, uh, reiterates the joy and the blessing that uh, comes from dwelling in, in God's presence. He expresses it. In, uh, in a real um, a real contrasting way when he says a day in thy courts is better than a thousand. I'd rather have one day in God's house than a thousand days anywhere else. Um, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. Or in other words, to just to be able to to, to live life to the fullest in the flesh, right? Why was that? Why did he, um, why did he have that kind of uh, perspective? Why did he desire to be uh, one day in the house of God rather than a thousand days uh, and in any other place or the place of his choosing? Well, he, he, uh, gives us uh, the answer here in verses 11 and 12. And that is because to him, he says, the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory, and no good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. So this is his explanation uh, for desiring the presence of God. He, 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 uh, he talked up the tabernacles of God in verse 1 and verse 2. Talked about how his soul longed for the courts of God and how his heart and his flesh cried out for the living God. Why? Well, because of what he knew of God. What the Lord is to him or was to him was invaluable for his life. He sees the character of God as indispensable. And that's why he would say, a day in thy courts is better than a thousand. That's why he would ask God to turn his face upon him. That's why he would beg God to hear his prayer and to give ear in accordance with his covenant promises. He sees the character of God as indispensable in his life. Now, how does he address God, or how does he describe God here? Number one, he describes him as a son. For the Lord God is a son. Now, this speaks to the Lord's role as provider. The son serves mankind as one of our greatest 
natural resources, right? The sun has great purpose and great usefulness in our lives. Now, uh, the psalmist in the ancient world would have had more naturally and readily under, understood the sun to be that resource than we do perhaps in our modern world, right? Today, we have, uh, we have uh, furnaces in our houses. We have lights in our houses. Um, in his day, he was much more limited, wasn't he? Uh, sun uh, mainly is for light and heat, right? And that's what he would have understood it to, to, to mean and to provide in his life. And uh, he would have understood that probably more keenly than we would in our modern world where we, uh, where we could um, heat our houses without the sun, where we could, um, where we could uh, um, see uh, in the dark because of our... Um, because of the, the lighting that we have. So the sun was, was more essential to them. They, they could, of course, build a fire and warm themselves and provide light for themselves, but even that was limited to them. And so he understood the sun to be essential to his daily living. He understood that, uh, that, uh, that, 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 just as the sun was essential to his daily living, so was the Lord essential. The Lord God, he says, is a sun. In other words, he's my resource. He's my provider. He is what I need to live on a daily basis. He understood that essential, that essential need of basic provision was met for him in God. That's why he calls God a son, because he is the provider, and he plays that role in your life and in my life as well. He is our natural resource. Question is, do we use, uh, do we use him as our natural resource? He's made himself available as such, Spiritually speaking, is God our resource? Is he our son? He describes him not only as a son, but a shield. He says in verse 11, the Lord God is a son and shield. Now, the Lord as his shield speaks to the Lord's role as his protector, right? No doubt the sense of need for physical protection was also more keen in that ancient world than it is for us today in modern America, right? Uh, we, uh, we are uh, privileged with uh, protection, with safety in our, in our world, in our circumstances. But for him, uh, he would have needed more protection. He would have sensed a more keen need of this protection that he says the Lord was for him. Oh, uh, uh, Lord, the Lord God is a sun and a shield. Shield would have been his best defense in battle or in some type of fight. But no doubt, he's not just speaking about the physical realm, he's speaking of the spiritual realm too, right? So the Lord God is a sun and shield. This threat of harm was a reality for him, and God was his defense against any feeling of vulnerability. And so making God his protector, his shield, meant that he placed his faith in God's personal care for him and in God's unlimited power over all of his, uh, or all, o over all forces that would come against him, be they physical, emotional, spiritual, whatever. The Lord is his shield. He understood God, number one, as his provider, and number two, as his protector. The Lord God is a sun and a shield. The test of our relationship with God 
is what we think he is to us, right? Who is God to us? That's the test of our relationship with him. How important is he a resource in our lives? Um, how often do we, as the, as the um, songwriter put, uh, uh, repair to him or go to him for help, for, for uh, security? That's the test of our relationship. What do we think God is to us? Do we, do we echo uh, this thought here? Lord God is a sun and a shield. Is he our provider? Is he our protector? Do we look at him that way? Do we think of him that way? Do we go to him in that way? The names that we give to God reveal the depth of our walk with him in the depth of our experience of his fullness in our lives. What do we call God? And I'm not speaking just literally, but what do we go to him for? What do we call upon him for, right? The psalmist goes on in verse 11 and he says, the Lord will give grace and glory. Now, he's speaking with great certainty here, isn't he? He says, the Lord will give. Not the Lord gives, but the Lord will give. He speaks here with certainty, and that kind of certainty is no doubt born out of personal experience. He understood the Lord being a sun and a shield to him by experience can then be expected to act, to give. He says the Lord will give two things here. Number one, grace. There was a certainty of grace in his heart and mind coming from the Lord. Grace is simply, we could say, God's goodness in action, right? God's goodness in action, his goodness poured out upon him, uh, uh, upon us. Many times in the Old Testament it's translated favor, right? Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. In other words, he found favor in God's eyes. God looked upon him, right? This is what he's praying for, isn't he? Verse 9, O God our shield, uh, behold, O God our shield, and look upon the face of thine anointed. Pour out your grace upon me. That's the prayer. And the answer that he knows is that the Lord will give grace and glory. Grace, God's goodness in action, God's favor toward men. It is God making himself available as the resource that is needed. We find throughout the Psalms, David and Asaph and others who penned these um, these songs, we find them uh, acknowledging uh, very, very plainly and very humbly their need. Bow down thine ear, I am poor and needy. I think that's in the 86th Psalm. Poor and needy. We need God's grace. We need uh, to take him as the resource that he has made himself available us, uh, to us to be. The Lord will give grace, and what else will the Lord give? Glory. The Lord will give grace and glory. What is God's glory? God's glory is his splendor. It's his majesty. It is that, uh, the, 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 the word literally has the idea of a, a weightiness, right? And, and so that, 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 that speaks to us of, uh, something of real substance. And uh, that's the splendor of God. Something that, 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 that we can, uh, we could say, sink our teeth into, right? Something that we could, we, we could gaze at for, uh, uh, for, for, for days, right? 
That's the splendor, the glory of God. Now, 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 what does he mean, God will give grace and glory? What does he mean, God will give glory? Does God share his glory? Well, not in the sense of diminishing himself so that someone else can have his glory or the glory that's due unto his name, but he, he, he does give glory in the sense that he reveals his own glory into our lives, you could say, right? He reveals that splendor in our lives. Actively engaging in his child's life as sun and shield, God's glory shines into that life. That's how you and I receive God's glory. When he actively engages as our son or as, and as our shield, as our provider and as our protector, God's glory shines into our lives. And so we see the Lord God is a sun and shield, and because of that, the Lord will give those two things, grace and glory. That grace and glory that God gives is comprehensive, isn't it? Notice what he says in that last phrase of verse 11. He says, no good or no good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. So the grace and glory of God is comprehensive. It provides in the believer's life a fullness of, of spiritual provision. There's nothing lacking in God's giving of his grace and his glory to his children. It's comprehensive. There's no good thing that's withheld. This speaks to the heart of God, doesn't it? It is pure goodness. God's heart is pure goodness because according to what he says here, there is no desire to shortchange the upright, but only to fill to the fullest. God isn't in the business of looking to give us a quarter tank here or a half tank there, right? No good thing will he withhold from them that walk upright. God's not interested in sprinkling down a few blessings into the life of the saint who is upright in heart. God's business is filling his creatures with all of his fullness. All that is needed is supplied. All that is promised is supplied. Every good thing, he says, will be supplied. God will give grace and glory, and it will be comprehensive. There will be no lack. Now, there's a condition here, isn't there? No good thing will he withhold from who? From them that walk uprightly. There's a condition here, and that condition is an uprightness of heart. The idea here literally to be entire, to be entire. No good thing will he withhold from, that, from them that walk uprightly or in entirety. So the idea here is it, it, it's to be entire toward God. So, so we could say this, nothing lacking Toward God means nothing lacking from God, right? That's literally what he's saying. He will withhold nothing from them that walk uprightly or them that are entire toward him, toward them that, 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 uh, uh, that, that don't fail to give him everything. Now that's... Uh, that that that's a, a um, that's a serious condition that he puts. 
upon us. No good thing will he, will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. In other words, from them that walk in fullness or entirety toward God. It's full surrender, right? It's the same thing we see uh, we, we see in the Gospels and, and, and in the Epistles, right? Jesus said, if any man uh, will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Perfect picture of walking uprightly. So nothing lacking toward God in your life and in my life means nothing lacking from God into your life or my life. No good thing. Amen? Verse 12. He kind of wraps things up here in verse 12. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the man that trusteth in thee. This wrap on this psalm is a simple truth in which we can rest, and it is a promise for us to claim. Blessed is the man that trusteth in thee. The God who withholds no good thing from the upright is the God who can be fully trusted. And the fullness found in that trust brings real happiness or blessedness. Blessed is the man that trusteth in thee. That was his testimony. That was his personal experience of God. Right. If he had an, if he had if he did not have a full hearted trust and confidence in God, he couldn't have written My soul longeth ye even fainteth for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh crieth out for the living God. Blessed are they that Dwell in thy house. Blessed is the man whose strength is in thee. Right? This is his testimony. And he sums it up here in verse 12 with this matter of faith. Blessed is the man that trusteth in thee. Brings happiness. Brings joy beyond compare. Joy beyond description. Joy that surpasses any happiness that the world can give or can understand. It's all because of who he knew God to be. He's a son and he's a shield. He's the kind of God that will give grace and glory to the fullest extent, to the extent that no good thing will be withheld from me. So I guess the question for us tonight is, is that our experience? Do we know God as our son, our provider? Do we know God as our shield or our protector? Do we know the grace and glory of God being poured into our lives? Do we have a testimony of having no good thing withheld from us? Because of the way in which we walk. And so what a challenge, um, what a challenge to us. And I trust that the Lord will allow these thoughts to, um, to continue to run through our hearts and minds as we go from this place tonight. But uh, let's close in prayer and ask the Lord's help. Lord, we just thank you for these wonderful truths. And I just pray that you would... Help us to, uh, Lord, to evaluate, Lord, our personal experience, Lord, with you, our, our relationship. How do we know you, Lord? By what name do we call you? Are you our son and our shield? Are you giving grace and glory into our lives, Lord? Are we lacking anything? If we are, it's not, it's not your fault, it's ours, Lord. It's a matter of walking uprightly. And so I pray, Lord, that you would just strengthen us 
to walk in, in such a way that we might receive all the fullness of God and that we might be blessed as we trust in you. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.